Focus is the new black. I'm going to talk about neurofeedback today. I'm doing a lot of it these days and I want you to have all the information so that you know whether it's something that you want to consider. So I listened to Ed Hamlin talk just for one day and he pretty much had me at hello. I hadn't thought a lot about things like focus when it came to therapy. I knew that what I was doing with my clients was creating a change in the way they focus because sometimes people would come into the room and they would say, that painting is new, right? Or when did you get these new doors? I've never seen these doors before. And the, the doors in the painting had been there the whole time and been seeing them for months. The doors in the painting hadn't changed. What had changed was their focus, their level of interaction or connectedness with what was happening around them. One of the big jobs that our brain has is to figure out how to balance intense focus and calm. If we're doing math, if we're playing a sport, if we're doing any task, we need to focus on that task and shut out everything else. Other times we need to be calm. When there's nothing going on, we want to just be able to chill. When we're falling asleep. So what our brain has to be able to figure out is how to inject energy when energy needs to be injected and how to calm. About a hundred years ago, it was actually two Canadians who came up with this theory, the arousal theory, not sexual arousal, but arousal in terms of alertness, that different activities require different states of alertness. So that's back like a hundred years ago. Also a hundred years ago, they discovered EEG, like brainwave patterns, the electrical language that our brain has. Also about a hundred years ago, we've got three things going on, right? electrical brain language, the arousal theory, and then biofeedback. What is biofeedback? If your body was hooked up to a computer and on, that, on a screen, you saw live information about something that was happening in your body right at that moment, say your heart rate, or a number that reflected your skin temperature, or something blue that reflected your brain waves. And I said, what I want you to do is put more space between those peaks or make that number go up or down or turn that blue into green. Even if I didn't give you any instructions about how to do that, you would be able to do it. Neurofeedback is easier than that because I tell you exactly what to do. But that's biofeedback, using information about what's happening in your body to change what is happening in your body. EEG neurofeedback is a type of biofeedback that uses brain waves. You're getting information about what your brain waves are doing and you're using your conscious mind to change what's happening with your brain waves. Brain waves are very connected to that state of alertness, focus and calm that I talked about a few minutes ago. So there are generally three kinds of brain waves, really slow brain waves, medium sized brain waves and fast brain waves, right? The slowest are the delta waves that are deep sleep waves. We'll talk a lot about theta. Theta are the next level of slow waves. They are transitional waves from wake into sleep. They are daydreamy waves. They are great creative waves. Medium sized brain waves are called alpha waves. They are sort of the, the frequency of presence, just calm alertness. As the brain waves get faster, we go into the beta range. And the low end of the beta range is called SMR, sensory motor rhythm. And then we go into the faster betas. And faster betas are what we use when, when we're focused, when we need intense focus. So the slower the brain wave, the lower the level of arousal. A lot of times we're either focused or calm. Kind of rare that we're both. I'm going to tell you a little story about cats right now. Barry Sternum was the guy who in the 1950s took those three ideas of, you know, biofeedback and brain waves and uh, arousal and put them together. So Barry Sternum and his crew were looking at these cats and their brain waves. And what they noticed was that there was this really cool period when the cats were about to be fed. When the cats were about to be fed, they were very focused on that food bowl. But they were also very calm. So this combination of focus and calm was very interesting to them. And they were very happy, of course, because they were about to be fed. So Barry was very interested in this range of brain waves that they called SMR, sensory motor rhythm. It's, it's the, the low beta range. So they decided to see if they could get the cats 
to make more of that SMR range. So they found that they could easily get the cats to make more SMR by rewarding the cats with food and sounds every time their SMR went up just the tiniest little bit. So soon they had a bunch of cats that were making more SMR. Then they weren't sure what to do with that, so the cats went back in the cage. So later on, Barry was doing some work with NASA that was about seizures and how to make brains seizure resistant. So you, that there's a group of cats who are making more SMR, right? So that group of cats were part of a bigger group of cats. So we got a big group of cats. Some of them already naturally have more SMR, right? So in this experiment, what they did was they exposed the cats to rocket fuel. I know, poor kitties, they don't do that anymore, but they did at the time because rocket fuel induces seizures. Well, what they discovered, happy accident, was that the cats whose brains had more SMR were already seizure resistant. Their brains didn't seem to want to seizure very easily. So there was this serendipitous discovery of, oh my gosh, when you shift brainwave patterns, this is the kind of thing that can happen. So that's what started the research. And even though the medical scientific community didn't take uh, neurofeedback very seriously because it was a, a natural thing and it didn't fit the scientific model of a brain that was sort of static and unchanging, right? Uh, it was poo-pooed as something that was not serious. More and more the scientific community is absolutely taking neurofeedback seriously because it sees what it can do. Okay, enough of the history lesson. Uh, let's talk about what neurofeedback can do for brains. What research has shown us is that neurofeedback can assist with things like sleep, anxiety, depression, epilepsy, seizures, migraines, ADD, ADHD, brain injury, autism spectrum, well, such a wide range of things can be that can be affected. With children, it's most often used for, for ADD, ADHD, for emotional regulation, developmental trauma, and addiction. Addiction is another area where uh, neurofeedback is big. It's not just for a brain that's struggling to function. They use neurofeedback in golf academies, in music academies. Astronauts are trained with neurofeedback. So I have trained my own brain. Sometimes people ask me. And uh, what I didn't realize until I started training my brain was that I do have a sort of a little bit of ADD light. <laughs> The training has helped me sleep more soundly, uh, be a little more calm, a little more focused and less scatterbrained, more productive. Uh, and interestingly, I, I do some very amateur singing with my ukulele. And since I've trained my brain, I would say I've had a lot of comments about how my singing voice seems to have improved. Now, maybe it sucked at the beginning. I don't know. Three main things that we try to shift with neurofeedback as far as arousal in the brain are over arousal, under arousal, and an unstable arousal. Unstable arousal is a term that we would use to describe a brain that maybe has a bipolar traits migraines, uh, epilepsy, um, maybe developmental trauma. So sometimes we're trying to increase the stability in a brain. An under aroused brain is basically a brain that is not alert enough when it needs to be alert. There are often too many theta waves, too many of those sleepy big waves going on in a waking state that would interfere with your ability to be alert and on task maybe memory, cognition, learning, it would affect all of those things. Then the main goal with neurofeedback is to reduce the amount of theta waves in the waking state. An over aroused brain is very much the opposite. It is a brain that is over alert. It is maybe hyper alert, uh, racing negative thoughts. There's a lot of anxiety. There's maybe trauma. It's a brain that is not calm enough, that cannot calm itself down. This is usually a brain that has too many beta waves, high levels of high beta going on that are interfering with its ability to be calm. In that case, our main goal in neurofeedback is to lower beta. So it's usually one of those three things. So in a nutshell, an under aroused brain is one that's stuck in low gear uh, and an over aroused brain is one that's stuck in high gear. So my daughter Lara came in and volunteered for me to train her brain. I've never done that with her before. My son Lucas did the photography and the videotaping.
thing we're gonna do, Laura, is scrub your ears. Ooh. Uh, like clean so, them? Yeah. Well, yes, we're scrubbing the dead skin cells off. There's a lot, so have fun. <laughs> she has never done this before, have you? No. Are you feeling nervous or slightly? <laughs> what are you nervous about? I just am wondering about what my brain's gonna tell you. Mm -hmm. This is the best part so far. So basically what we're doing is trying to get a really good connection. I feel so judged. These are the electrodes. Mm -hmm. These are the little emitters that go in your ears. Your fingers are cold. Am I gonna feel anything? You mean when we're doing the treatment? Yeah. The only part you really feel is the, the scrubbing. You're gonna have and to then, wash my hair after this? Oh, so electrode with some conductor paste going on your scalp. The first thing I did with Laura was a little mini EEG to see where her brain waves were operating at three spots, just as a baseline to start. That's not something that we do every time. And I looked at her symptoms, how she was sleeping, what her emotions were doing, what her level of focus was in order to determine which protocol I want to use. So the lower the number, the slower the brain wave. Two to eight, these are your fade away. So these are those daydreamy waves that we don't want too many of in our waking state. That number, 16.3, that's how much theta is going on in your brain right now. I want you to look at that 16.3 and bring it down just by focusing on that number. In the 14s, very good. Our, our, our brains are sort of like a camera lens. We can take in lots of stuff, make the picture really big, the focus really wide, or we can narrow our focus to one particular thing. When you narrow your focus, you, you reduce how much theta your brain has at that moment. That is half of what you're going to be doing during the game. Uh, beta number, uh, the fast waves, you're already down to the six. So it's a very low number. Some people have double digits of beta and we really have to train them to, to calm their bodies. So that's the other half of your goal during the neurofeedback game is to keep your body as relaxed as you can. What you just saw there was Laura having a chance to look at my screen and she could see how much theta her brain was producing at that moment. She could see that when she focused on that number, she brought her theta down. And she could see how when she relaxed her body, she brought her beta down. So now she has an understanding of exactly what's going on in neurofeedback and how she's controlling her brain waves using her state of focus and her state of calm. Oh, let's get you comfy, Lara. I'm going to put the weighted blanket on you. So Lara's in a really comfortable, relaxed position. And she knows that her two goals are to focus on the screen and to calm her body. You'll see, Lara, on the left-hand side here, there's a, a bar. Right. So if you see purple up here, that means that you need to focus more on the screen. If you see yellow over here, this is your beta. That means relax your body, tension is rising. In general, if you get a little more focused and a little more calm from when you start, you'll do well in the game. Okay. And I say you do well in the game, but you can't really suck at this because it's your unconscious brain that's being trained, not your conscious brain. You're just taking your conscious brain, taking Lara and putting her aside. Your job is to put your griffin through the green ring. The only way to do that is to do the two things I asked you to do. So the beeps that you heard during the game were simply the computer rewarding Lara's brain for finding that place of greater calm and greater focus. How much neurofeedback will I need or benefit from is the question I get a lot. There's no telling, it's, it's such an individual thing. I have had people be completely satisfied with 10 sessions. Um, 10 is the minimum that I require in order to work with you. Most people do 20, 30, 40, and some people do require much more if there's severe trauma in their history. Neurofeedback is a very individual treatment. Brains are sort of like golf clubs in that they have a sweet spot. And we spend the first uh, couple, two, three, four sessions looking for that sweet spot. Because of that, there could be some negative experiences at the beginning of neurofeedback. You could have a headache, you could be super tired, maybe you have a worse sleep than normal. 
those things are correctable. For that reason, I ask you to schedule the first four or five appointments pretty close together, like twice weekly, so that if that happens, we can quickly make a correction. How long can I expect the change to last is something that I often get asked. In the beginning, you might feel nothing, or after the first treatment, you might feel something that lasts maybe 24 hours. The idea is just that it builds. The more appointments you have, the longer the effects tend to last, and then you just keep going until you find that you're holding on to those changes. Once the brain finds that more efficient pattern, it really does want to keep doing it long after the treatments end. So neurofeedback is not a miracle cure. It doesn't work for absolutely everyone and it doesn't work the same for any two people, really. Your journey through neurofeedback is very individual and very much your own. I have seen it do amazing things for people when it comes to sleep, anxiety, depression, even things like autism, brain injury, migraines, epilepsy. Uh, and I'm curious about what it could do for you. If you're committed, I'll meet you in the treatment room. Uh, as a thank you to my daughter, Lara, for helping me and agreeing to have her brain trained, I'm gonna give her a little uh, chance here to plug her business. If you're in need of a doula, you wanna hear this. Do you wanna tell me what you do? I am co-owner of Dynamic Doulas of London, and we provide informational, educational, and physical support, as well as emotional support for pregnant people and birthing people and postpartum people. Uh, usually a baby coming out of someone's vagina is involved. We uh, have a ton of experience. We both come from medical background. I'm a massage therapist. My partner is a kinesiologist. We've done over a hundred births and we know what we're talking about. We have very happy clients. Focus, blah, 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 blah. This is so weird. Okay, maybe so, um, two. No, 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 I go back to the cats. Oh. Oh. Or, is that what my hair looks like from the back? I think I just look in the mirror and like if the front is okay, I don't, I don't even look at the back. I think I should. Where's the light? Okay, I should have had the light on when I did all that.